Uh, okay, good afternoon everyone. Welcome to the fifth lecture in numerical methods and computing. So, so far we have discussed about the matrices, the properties, determinant uh, inverse of a matrix. And after that, we moved on to the eigenvalues and eigenvectors in the last lecture. And now we are going to continue our discussion about eigenvalues and how to calculate them or compute them, is where to say, using numerical methods, okay? But let's have a very quick overview or review of what we have said. So we said that we have A as a matrix, so we assume this A is a square matrix, so number of rows and columns are the same, and X is an eigenvector. Which is, the, which is corresponding to the eigenvalue lambda. So we said that this lambda and x, the eigenvalue and eigenvectors, are a pair. They are, a, a, they are a, a, a eigenpair. So in order to, to calculate the eigenvalues, so you, su you should subtract this minus, uh, you should subtract lambda multiplied by the identity matrix from a matrix A, and let the determinants be zero. So from there, we said that we could find the characteristic polynomial associated to the matrix A. And from there, we can find n eigenvalues for, a, for an n by n matrix A. Then plugging each of the eigenvalues in the definition that we have for the eigensystem, we can calculate the eigenvectors associated to each uh, eigenvalue. And then we talked about a very important uh, property, which is linear independence. So this is, in general, applicable to the vectors. And in particular, in this setting, we, are, we would like to investigate linear independence of the eigenvectors that we find for a matrix. Okay? And it's very important for us, because if we show that the eigenvectors can, are independent, are linearly independent for a, for a matrix, then it means that these eigenvectors are uh, constructing a complete set in order to, uh, to, to expand any object which is in the vector space of dimension n. So as an example, we went through this. And then we said that in order for these three eigenvectors, x1 to x3, to be linearly independent, c1 to c3, they have to be 0 at the same time. Then we said that, OK, even though we have n by n matrix, maybe the eigenvalues, which are distinct, the number of them is less than n, which means that a few of the eigenvalues are repeated. So these matrices are defective. Why? Because the n eigenvectors cannot be linearly independent, and they cannot form a, linear, uh, a complete space. So exactly, we can look at this matrix, which is the uh, Jordan block matrix. So all the elements, or maybe I can move to. OK, I'm talking about this matrix that is called Jordan block. So all elements on the main diagonal are something like mu. They are constant. And uh, exactly close to the main diagonal here, we have 1. And the rest of the elements are 0. So can you tell me what is the eigenvalue or eigenvalues of this matrix? So for, to, to find the eigenvalues, we should let this expression, this determinant be 0. So each time we have to expand around, for instance, first time we expand around this uh, A11, because the rest of the elements in this column are 0. So then for this, we have to find the determinant of the matrix that has size n minus 1 by n minus 1 after removing the first row on the first column. And then we expand around this. And again, we reduce the size of the matrix one more time. And we continue this. So in the end, you are going to end up with this. OK? 
okay? So we have only one value for the eigenvalue, and that is mu, and this is repeated n times. And this matrix is clearly defective. Because we are supposed to have n distinct eigenvalue with n linearly independent eigenvectors. But in this case, you cannot do that. And this remains a homework for you to find what is the eigenvector corresponding to this uh, eigenvalue mu. That's quite, maybe you can just do it, just plug, I mean, yeah, try it, it's nice, okay? Uh, now let's look at another interesting uh, matrix. It's kind of a very special matrix. We call it triangular matrix. We can have either upper triangular or lower triangular. So in this case that we have upper triangular, it means that the main element and the elements above that are non-zero in general. And whatever that is below that is zero. Okay, so which means that we have here zero and the non-zeros are there. And it's upper triangular because we are interested in the non-zero element, uh, element part of the matrix. So if you would like to compute, to calculate the eigenvalues, again we start from the definition, which means that the determinant of this matrix here, when we have subtracted this lambda from the main diagonal elements, has to be zero. So, you can try it, and you can calculate the eigenvalues, but can you quickly tell me what would be those eigenvalues? Any comment, idea? Yes, please. Exactly. All the elements on the main diagonal are going to be our eigenvalues. So we have n elements a11, a22 to a n n on the main diagonal, and these are going to be the n eigenvalues that we are looking for. Which means that these guys here are the eigenvalues. So <clears throat> this is a very important property, which means that if we are able if you are able to reduce or reform a matrix, a given matrix, into an upper or lower triangular, then we are done with defining the eigenvalues because when we get this triangular matrix, all the elements on the main diagonal are the eigenvalues, and that's it. So instead of kind of calculating eigenvalues directly using the definition, one, may, one idea is that we reform or reshape the, the, the matrix into a triangular matrix. And this is exactly the main point to, of some, some methods in calculating the eigenvalues. So quickly I will go through them. Uh, so before that we have to have this definition or this approach. What I'm going to say now for, for a few slides, okay, I'm going to specify it. It's not going to, it's not going to be examined because mathematically is a bit involved, so I'm not going to derive a, everything. I'm just trying to kind of transfer the, the whole, I mean, the main idea, okay? But it's important that you learn, I mean, to, to understand what I'm, going, what I'm talking about, but you don't need to understand the mathematics. So, something that you will hear a lot in linear algebra is called QR decomposition. So they are not standing for anything, this Q and R, but the first time someone just suggested that, okay, if we have a real square matrix like A, always we can kind of decompose it into this, the multiplication of these two matrix, Q and R. So what is Q? Q is an orthogonal matrix, okay? Which means that any column of Q, matrix Q that we pick up, and then we pick up another column, and these are distinct columns, these are going to be orthogonal to each other. So for QI and QJ, 
the inner product is going to be zero, and these two are two columns of Q, two distinct columns of uh, Q. Okay? And another important thing is that Q transpose Q is Q Q transpose, and this multiplication is going to be the identity matrix. And if you remember, we had this if we had Q multiplied by Q inverse. Okay? But this time is we have Q transpose. And this means, this means that the Q, T, and Q inverse are the same. So this is the property of the first, first matrix here, Q. All right? So this is orthogonal matrix. The column of that are orthogonal to each other. And also Q, T, Q is Q, Q, T is I. And then we have the other guy, R, here. And this is going to be an upper triangular matrix. And we already talked about the nice property of the triangular matrix, that if we can get them or reform a matrix into a triangular matrix, uh, matrix then the elements on the main diagonal are the eigenvalues of the original matrix. Okay? So this means that if we can make use of this uh, decomposition here, then we can calculate the eigenvalues of the original matrix A. And of course, to get this numerically, to get this, we have different approaches. One is the Gram-Schmidt uh, orthogonalization, and the other one is householder transformation. So this is, uh, these are the approaches that for a given A, we get these two matrices Q and R. And by the way, this A is n by n, by n, and each of these two is also n by n. So all of them are square matrices. So, as we said, we can use this QR decomposition to find the the eigenvalues of a matrix. So this is going to happen through iteration. Okay? This is not just a mathematical thing that we do it once and we get the answer. So this is exactly, if you remember, in the first meeting, of the first lecture, we said that always we would like to transfer the continuous mathematical equations into discrete equations. And this is going to be done by numerical analysis. And this is the case. So when we are talking about calculating, we usually mean that we just do it analytically using mathematical methods. But when we say we would like to compute it, it means that we are doing numerical analysis, we are doing computation, okay? So in this case, we are going to have to design an iterative algorithm. That, is, that means that we start from an initial guess and do it several times to get what we want. So this is for, for the eigenvalue, sorry that I'm going to talk about. But before that, I forgot to say that, as we said, we have householder transformation in order to calculate the Q R and R parts of matrix A. So here we pick up uh, any column of A, and then we find the magnitude of that. Then we have this E, which is a unit vector. So E I is size N, is a vector, uh, a column vector, all elements of that are zero, but the ith one, which is one. And then we normalize ui that we have formed like this. Then we can find q tilde, and then we have this block matrix here. We find qi. So we do this, we start from qn, sorry, first of all, from one and go to, to, to n and we find this Q1, Q2 to Qn. Then multiply them together, and then by A, and we get the R, and transpose of each of these Qs multiplied together will give us Q. Okay, as I say, I mean, the, the, it, this is quite mathematically involved, so we are not going to get into it, and you are not going to be examined on this. But just know, but you should know that A can be decomposed into Q and R, Q is orthogonal, and R is upper triangular. So exactly, we are going to use this property, as we said, in, a, in, a, in an iterative way to calculate the eigenvalues of A. So for this, we say that, okay, if we have matrix A of, and this, this A is real, then we would like to do iteration starting from 
step zero. Uh, for step zero, we say that this A zero is the same as A. And what we do is that for iterations from zero to whatever that it takes until convergence, first, we are going to decompose matrix AK to QK, RK. And then we are going to update A by multiplying R by Q. It's just after finding this, we just switch them, and both of them are N by N, and multiply them. And we get AK plus one. And we go to the next step. So we substitute AK by AK plus one, and we go to the next iteration. And we continue that until the difference between the two matrices or the elements of two matrices, the AK and K plus A plus AK plus one in two iterations become less than some given threshold. Okay? This is how the, the iteration is going to stop. So anyway, we just do this iteration and after that we are going to end up with this RK which is the upper triangular Q is the orthogonal, and this AK plus one becomes a triangular matrix itself after doing the iteration. And this is exactly what we wanted, because if A is reformed into an tri upper triangular or lower triangular matrix, then the diagonal elements are the eigenvalues of the original matrix that was this A given here. Okay, A has been reformed to A n plus one after n iterations. So why does this hold? I mean, why the whole thing works? Can you tell me? Okay, it's easy. Just start from the definition here. A k plus one is R k Q k. So what we can do is that we multiply it here and from the left by Q k inverse Q k, and we know that these are this is I, and then Q k. RK, these two middle matrices, are the same as AK according to step one. So we just do that, and we said that Q is an orthogonal matrix, so Q inverse is the same as Q transpose. So we get this. So again, from some basic linear algebra properties, when we have this expression, AK plus one equal to QK transpose AK QK, it means that AK and AK plus one have similar structure, which means that the eigenvalues are the same. As we said, I mean, we continue this, this AK plus one because it becomes triangular and we find the eigenvalues. Of course, this is not a very, I mean, this is not a closed form, mathematical form, it's through iterations. And this is exactly something that we do in practice when we want to use uh, computers. We have to have a numerical algorithm and this is one of those things. So the nice thing is that this QR method is actually the method behind the command eig, e -I -G, that we use in MATLAB, okay? For a, any general matrix that are given, just like this A. So we say eig of A, and this is going to return to us this V, which is N by N matrix, and each column of V is an eigenvector of the matrix A. And this D is going to be the diagonal of D are the eigenvalues of A. So whatever we have learned so far about this QR method is kind of behind this eig. Okay? This is like the top, le top level that we see when we use MATLAB. We write eig A and what's happening in behind, behind the curtain is that this algorithm is being run. Okay? So it's, it means that it, it's good to know about this algorithm because it's something that, that, that is kind of being used in practice. So sometimes, I mean, we are not so much interested to find all the eigenvalues, but we are more interested in finding the first k eigenvalue which has the largest magnitude. In that case, put an s and use eigs of a and k and find the first k eigenvalues. If you would like to find the QR decomposition of A, I mean this Q and R, so for instance here, just write QR. Okay, so what, what, we, what you need to know is that uh, 
these triangular matrices are nice because they give us directly the eigenvalues of the uh, matrix. And then we can use this property in order to compute the eigenvalues of the matrix. Do you have any questions so far? Yes, please. You mean Q? So this is a definition. So each column of K that you pick up, any two columns of Q that pick up are orthogonal. And since this, is, this holds for any two columns of Q, the whole matrix is called orthogonal. And another property is that Q transpose is equal to Q inverse. Okay? This is a very important uh, property when you go to the transformation of the coordinates and transformation of the systems, but we are not going to deal with them in this course. But they have very, they have very nice properties, these orthogonal matrices. Yeah. Other questions or comments? Okay, now we go to the next method. And this one is called the power method. So this is the end of the part that I said that you don't need to, I mean, go through the mathematics or to the details. Now you should, again, be prepared for some mathematics. So the second method that we are going to talk about is the power method. So, in contrast to the QR method that could give us all the eigenvalues of the matrix, the power method is just going to give us the largest magnitude eigenvalue, or the eigenvalue with the largest magnitude, or the eigenvalue with the smallest value or magnitude. So, again, this is an iterative method to give us the largest or smallest eigenvalue. So we are talking about small and large, and by the, by this means in terms of the magnitude that an eigenvalue has, because we said that eigenvalues should, can be complex numbers. Okay? So this means that if we have a matrix that is n by n, it means that we have n eigenvalues. So if we find the magnitude of them, say that we can just sort them, like in ascending order. which means that the largest magnitude is, I mean, the, the, the eigenvalue with the largest magnitude is lambda n, and the one with the smallest magnitude is lambda 1. So this absolute value means magnitude. So that works if, any, a, a, uh, if the eigenvalue is a real number or a complex number. So basically, we say that, okay, we, 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 we want to find this. So power method, I guess in, in the next tutorial, you're going to, going to kind of use it or applying it. Okay? So, so it's good to, to understand the basics of that. So as we said, this is an uh, iterative method, and the algorithm is like this. So first we, we pick up a vector that is like an initial guess. I call it B0, B0. So, for instance, this can be uh, 
a column vector of size n. Again, we have a n by n. So the first element is one, the rest are zero. It's just you can just actually pick up any other thing as b zero. So this is the initial guess. And this is the meaning of iteration, always numerical methods. So we start from an initial guess and somehow force this initial guess and improve it to, to, to become closer to the final answer. So then we have a for loop, which means that we are going to repeat this process. And since k, 1, 2, and we are going to continue it until convergence. So in the first step, we are going to update our vector B. And this is, so the matrix, the original matrix that we have A, we multiply this by BK and divide this by the magnitude or the norm of this vector. Okay, so what we do here, this a, a is n by n, okay? So here we pick up a, an n by, n by one vector, that's initial guess, and this b, if we have the algorithm converged, this b is going to be the eigenvector associated to the largest uh, magnitude eigenvalue. But since we don't know it, we just assume something for it, and we do some iteration to find it. So as we said, okay, first, <clears throat> okay, we should start this k from zero, sorry. So if you plug k to be zero, then it, this becomes b1, which means that the next iteration of b0 is that a multiplied by b0, but we have learned how to do it, because a is n by, one, n, by n, and b0 is n by one. So the resulting here is going to be n by, n by 1. It's a, ve it's a column vector again. Is it clear? Do you, do you agree with me? Okay, a is n by n, then this multipli multiplied by this b0 here, that is n by 1. Again, it gives us a vector, a column vector n by 1. So this is a vector, then we can calculate the norm of that vector. You remember? In the, in the last lecture, we defined the norm, and we said that this is like a way to measure a vector or a matrix. And in particular, we said that if we have something like a vector and L2 norm, this is going to be some of the squares of the components of that vector. And then we take square root of that. And this is the case again here. As we said, as a result of A multiplied by BK, we get an N by 1 metric uh, vector. Then it's easy to, fo to follow this expression, okay, and calculate the value in the denominator. And this is just a single value, it's a scalar. It's a positive scalar. Okay, so this is the first step. And what do we do afterwards is that we project, so we say that next, I mean, or the, the updated value of the eigenvalue, the largest, the, the eigenvalue with the largest magnitude. So I put this n here, okay, because I have to put this index k plus 1 here. So we have to project this a, b, k by bk divided by bk bk so again this is like an inner product so here we said that this is exactly the same thing as here so this is a vector n by 1 find the find the inner product of that by bk which is again n by 1. So both numerator and denominator, they are scalars. So scalar divided by scalar, it gives us a scalar. And this is exactly what we are looking for. And this is, that is the eigenvalue 
that, that, that the eigenvalue which has the largest magnitude. Okay? So the expression in the denominator is actually the norm of the L2 norm of BK square, which means that the expression that we have here should be squared when, when it is written for BK. So we have to repeat this, right? We, we repeat that so until, so if like lambda k plus one minus lambda k n, so this is uh, less than epsilon, then we break the loop. Okay, this is exactly the convergence criterion. So when the, when the difference between the uh, eigenvalues in two successive iterations becomes less than a certain limit that is given, then we stop the iteration. Yes, please. Sorry. So again, when we use power method, we can, I mean, the standard for we can find the eigenvalue with the largest magnitude. Any question about the power method? Yeah, this is just one time. You can just put anything, but the vector size should be n. You can put anything instead of b0. This is the initial guess. Of course, if you are lucky, I mean, that can kind of reduce the number of iterations. But it doesn't matter in the end. But did I answer your question? The question was, is it 1, 0, 0, Uh-huh, yes. No, no, always, no, exactly. I'm saying this is arbitrary. I said just for example. Exactly, just, just for example, this. You can just pick up any other thing as long as you keep the size n. And this is initial guess, okay? And after you, you have the converged uh, loop, you are going to get a good estimate of the eigenvalue that with the largest magnitude and its corresponding eigenvector, which is bk plus 1. Okay, very good. So, what do you think is the kind of the main limitation of the power method or the limitations of the power method? So, the first thing is that, okay, I mean, the standard form is just can be used to find the eigenvalues with the largest magnitude. But we can see that we can modify it to find other eigenvalues as well, but just one at a time. Okay, it's not like the QR method that gives us all the eigenvalues just in one, one try. Just one by one you have to find them with the, using power method. And the second one is that, as we said, uh, we, we, we are assuming this. We are sorting the magnitude of the eigenvalues here. We are finding this guy. So the convergence rate of the power method is dependent on the ratio of the largest to the smallest eigenvalue. So which means that second largest to the largest magnitude. So if we have kind of a good difference between these two, we have a fast convergence. But if the two, large, lar two largest eigenvalues are very close to each other, have the, have the magnitudes very close to each other, then this convergence is going to be very slow. Okay? So this is one thing. But can you tell me if we can use the or how we can use the, the 
power method to find the eigenvalue with the smallest magnitude. So, for the eigenvalue with smallest magnitude. So, in standard form, it's just for the largest. But how can we modify the algorithm so that it finds the smallest eigenvalue? So that is in fact connected to this, that, so do you remember that we could find the inverse of matrix A? And we said that A inverse multiplied by A is equal to A multiplied by A inverse, and this is equal to the identity matrix. So on the other hand, we said that if we want to find the eigenvector, eigens values of a, a, a matrix A, then we have this expression. This, both are definitions. So in the second one, let's multiply both sides by minus 1, A minus 1, which is A inverse. So A inverse A x is equal to A inverse lambda x. So we said that this is I, so this is x on the left hand side. Do you agree? Then what we say is that A inverse lambda x is x. So multiply both both sides by by or divide by lambda. Divide by lambda. So what we get is that a inverse x is 1 over lambda x. So this is a very important uh, expression because it tells us that if lambda and x, vector x, are the eigenpairs of a matrix A, then for A inverse, this x is going to remain the eigenvector, but that is corresponding to the eigenvalue 1 over lambda. Okay, so when we do, the, we calculate the, the, the inverse of matrix, the eigenvalue is inverted, but the corresponding original eigenvector remains the same. Does it make sense? Because we, we started from here. This is the original matrix. X is the eigenvector of X, A, sorry, and lambda the eigenvalue of that. But for A inverse, x is still the same, the eigenvector, but the eigenvalue is just inverted, 1 over lambda. So with this hint, can you tell me how to, how to use the power method in order to calculate the, smallest, the eigenvalue with the smallest magnitude? So then we go back to this question, and we say that so for A, we said that our assumption is that we have this order. And if we invert them, then we have 1 over lambda 1, 1 over lambda 2 magnitude. Okay? So then, here we have the largest magnitude eigenvalue, but one word is. But this belongs to A inverse. Yeah, sorry. So again, if we have A, okay, we can sort the eigenvalues in terms of their magnitude. So if we inverse them, okay, we have this expression. And now we can apply the power method to find the largest magnitude. And in this case, the largest magnitude is 1 over lambda 1. Right? And it means that the power method has to be applied to A inverse.
Okay? And there is another point. And can we use power method to find other eigenvalues, not just the one with the largest magnitude? The answer is yes, and we should note that A is the lambda i xi xi transpose. Okay? Because we can uh, decompose a matrix in terms of its eigenvalues and eigen uh, vectors. So when you find the largest, I mean, the eigenvalue with the largest magnitude, which is the lambda n, so what you can do is that you form like a tilde, which is a minus lambda n xi xn xn transpose. Okay? And then if you apply the power method to this, this gives us the lambda n minus 1, because this is the one that now has the largest value. And if you want to go to lambda n minus 2, you just do this again. You subtract from this a tilde, I mean the multiplication of lambda n minus 1, and associate the multiplication of eigenvectors. So, do you have any question about this? Yes, please. Sorry? On the power method, oh, sorry, yes, in the tutorials we have it. Yes, but not today, yes. But the thing is, but it's, not, it's not difficult, seriously, believe me. You just start from an initial guess and multiply A by that initial guess, normalize it, and project it, and you go to the next iteration. You, we, will, we, will, we will go through it in the tutorial, okay? If you have problem after that, let me know, and then I try to explain. Uh, okay. If no further questions, so, yes, please. Hey, which one? Here? Is A tilde? So A tilde is... Okay, we said that A, I mean, if we start from the definition of a matrix, we said that a matrix can be decomposed in terms of its eigenvalues and eigenvectors, right? And then, this is like a vector-vector multiplication that's going to give us a matrix. So we just, uh, we know that we have found lambda n and associated eigenvectors. We subtract those from A, and we form a new matrix that is n minus 1 by n minus 1 is A tilde. Because we already applied the power method and found this lambda n, an associated eigenvector. Okay? So we know that. Then subtract that expression from A, and we get A tilde, which is n minus 1 by n minus 1. And again, you apply power method to find lambda n minus 1 and x on n minus 1. So which means that Again, you can use that power method to find the, the, the spectrum of A, the, eigen, the set of eigenvalues, but it's just one by one. It's not like the QR that gives everything in one run. Okay. So with this, we go to the last part of the lecture, the lecture about the matrices. That is about the... Uh, Systems which are, which are kind of practical, we see them in different applications. Now you are, I guess, in year two, you will see them this year, next year, or after that in different courses, in different applications. So you will end up with matrices, with the systems of equations. 
to which the methods in this course are going to be applied. So one thing is just about the dynamical systems, okay? So we, here we have this pendulum and a rope. And we have the rope kind of tied to the roof from top. We have this tension force T and the gravity force. Okay, if we do not have any resistance in the air, for instance, with this with pendulum, if you release this weight M, mass M from some state, it's going to oscillate forever, right? And this is completely a harmonic oscillation. Therefore, we have a dynamical system. The dynamical system in general is being written like this. So this Y is the state vector, and T is time. And on the right-hand side, we have a function that can, in general, depend on time and state vector y. So any system, any equation that describes the evolution of a system in time is a dynamical system. Okay? Whatever that evolves in time is a dynamical system. It's, it's dynamic. It's just changing. And that change happens in time. Also, from a mathematical point of view, this is an initial value problem, which means that if you, for this first order OD in time, if you know the initial value, you plug it in the system, that's it. You can just find what would be the state of the system Y in any time, T. Okay? This first order, you only need one value as the initial condition. That's why we call it IVP, or initial value problem. So anyway... We know that, I mean, to this system, to describe the behavior of this system, theta, this angle, we have this second order differential equation, ordinary differential equation. Okay? And we can find the closed form solution for this if we have the initial condition for theta to be theta zero and the initial speed to be zero, which means that we release the mass at time zero without any initial velocity. So we get this closed form solution. Now the question is that, okay, the system can have two equilibrium points. One is this guy for which theta is zero, but the other one is a bit idealistic. If we could have kind of just uh, put it upward, Okay, so in this case we have force T and mg, I mean downward both, but we do not have any force in the sides for none of these two cases, which means that ideally if we just put them in those, these two states, states, they are not going to move. These are kind of equilibrium points. But if they are exactly in that position. But what is the meaning of stability? It means that if we just perturb the system, we just move them a bit, do we get them kind of back to the original state, equilibrium state, or not? Sir? Yes? When a system is stable, any perturbance will be counteracted. When a system is unstable, any perturbance will be exacerbated. Exactly. So if this perturbation, this initial thing that we just exert on the system is going to grow over time, it's going to move the system away from its equilibrium. So the system becomes unstable. But for stable, it's the opposite. And this is not the purpose of this. The purpose of this example is that, so this is the application of the matrices and the eigenvalues. So at the beginning of this lecture, someone asked me about the, what, what, do the, what do the eigenvalues mean? And this is exactly the meaning of them. So this is like, a, they can be used for stability analysis. It's just one of the applications that's very important. If later you will see them in the control theory, for instance, always you just find this matrix A that describes the behavior of the system. You should find the eigenvalues of that and see if they are all stable or they are going to create some trouble over time and make the system more chaotic even. Anyway, in order to find these stable points, we have to find this, the, 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 the roots of the function on the right-hand side, okay? This is something that we have. But <clears throat> in this case, since we do not have a linear system in general, 
we do not have a linear system, which means that we do not have A multiplied by T on the right-hand side. But we say that these uh, state variables Y, okay, the, the derivative of that with respect to time is a function of Y and T. So we, we can have different uh, state vectors. So for instance, we can put the velocity, we can put the displacement, we can put the acceleration as different components of this state vector y. And f, corresponding to each of these state variables, we are going to have, in general, a right-hand side for the first order ODE. So something that we call Jacobian matrix can be calculated like this, that we look at the elements of f, and we take derivative of that with respect to any of the state vectors. So the first row of the Jacobian matrix is just this f1, okay? And the derivative of that with respect to the first state variable, second one, up to the n. And then we go to the second function, and we do the same. And finally, to the nth one, and take the derivative of that with y to n with respect to y to n. So in the end, we get this j as n by n matrix. So this is the Jacobian matrix in different systems, whatever you have. What you do is that you have this ordinary differential equation, this system of equation. This is a system of equation because we have more than one y. We have one y1 to y n. So the right-hand side, we have a vector of that. We should calculate the derivative of it with respect to different state variables, and we get the Jacobian matrix. And then we say that, OK, somehow we know what are the equilibrium points of the system that I call them y subindex e. This is like theta 0 and theta pi that we had in the previous slide. So you can see them here, OK, on the side. And what we do is that we, we, we put this guy and evaluate, I mean, this matrix J, so that we get values at all elements. Then that's it. We have matrix G, J. And what we should do is to calculate the eigenvalues of that. So in general, these eigenvalues can be complex numbers. So they can have a real part and imaginary part. And usually in dynamical systems, the general solution is described by exponential of the eigenvalue multiplied by time. OK? Which means that if I have a, a complex eigenvalue, I replace this lambda by that. OK, this is the real part plus the imaginary part. And then it's just a basic algebra. I take out this real part. And this guy within the parentheses here is just i lambda i t. So this is <clears throat> the first term that I get here. This is like the amplitude. And the guy within the parentheses here, parentheses here is oscillation. Just sine and cosine, right? If you find the values of that, I mean the amplitude of that is one, right? Always is one. Yes, please. Are examples like these um, examinable? Not this. This is just to understand the, the meaning of the, the importance of the eigenvalue. Thanks. Okay. <laughs> but what, what I try to say is that find the Jacobian of the system, find the eigenvalues. And then, based on the real part of the eigen, or the, based on the eigenvalues, you can dis, you can say if the system is stable or not, or the oh, sorry, equilibrium points are stable or unstable. And the reason for that is that this amplitude, if the real part, so if this, can you please? I mean, just a second. I, I'm going to finish soon. This lambda r, if it's negative, which means that this amplitude is not going to grow over time. Okay, so if you exert and